I synchronized my watch the atomic clock in Boulder by holding it. <laughs> wow, up. I am impressed. So I am does, impressed. Kelsey, I make that all up. But it does say two minutes past. Uh oh, well, I better talk faster then. <laughs> First of all, thank you guys for sitting in here. I hope it's uh, going to be enjoyable for you. And I'm going to split this time up. I'm going to do about a half an hour's worth. And then my esteemed partner, Rick Lank, is going to do a program about the Dalles Mint, which is kind of a phantom mint, and most people have never even heard of it. So, but I wanted to start and, as advertised, say a little bit about women, and women and your money, and women and my money, um, and many of the ways that women handled money, or what we think of as now as money handling, was started during the Civil War. But it actually started, for people handling money in the Mint, it started back in 1792. In 1792, the Coinage Act of the United States, and I'm sorry Ben Franklin isn't here to hear my accolade, he was one of the um, authors of the Coinage Act, and it was the first act to actually establish a U.S. Mint and establish coinage standards. But one of the things that people weren't thinking about is, how are we going to get all this stuff done? This was way before industrialization. So one of the things that women were hired to do initially, there were two women hired to be what they call adjusters. One of the things that, let me take it back one second. On, on the cover of our new book, which I got a pitch, you see in the center there are planchets. Those are examples of just blank coins. Now those are coming off the press, off of a roll, but the, you know, the Mint wants to know how valid those coins are. are. Do they weigh the right amount? You don't want to be giving away more than you should. Are they, do they have all of the, um, the um, are, are they finished properly? So thus the job, a new industry in coin making, and a new job, there is now a group called the adjusters. So women are hired to be adjusters, partly because they're very uh, dexterous. This was not a very neat and fun job. Women were somewhat cloistered. They was dusty. You had to keep the rooms closed because you didn't want any dust from the gold and the silver just tracking out. The women had to often wear a leather um, apron. This is a little bit later, this picture, or this sketch, and it shows women in short sleeves, the less um, possibility of having any kind of fabric that you, that any of the gold dust and silver dust could go out with. You don't want that. Risque um, at the time. What is that? That was risque at the time. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. This, the, risque. What is that? Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness, yes. <laughs> but they had to stay in the rooms. They, you know, they had their own lunchroom, and they... Um, but they were rated on how many units they were able to produce. They did filing. They all have scales there. So this was a very precise job. And one of the things that I found kind of interesting, you're going to hear this as a little theme for a couple points, but in the 1792 listing of what women, what wages were for the new mint, women were paid, the two women, who were adjusters were paid 50 cents a day. There was a character at the Mint called The Boy who made 66 cents a day. But women were, who had this very important job, were the absolute lowest paid people in that particular salary, in that particular new operation for the United States. So we now have U.S. coins, and there was no, um, there was, at that point in time, there was no printed U.S. money. And I'd just like to show you, this is something that we have over at our table, an example of this. We don't have the real, real deals, but we have a picture. And um, prior to having coinage, the United States did not have its own printing of money. But the banks and individual entities, local uh, privately issued states, states and banks had issued their own paper money, but these weren't things that were very portable. They're rarely widely circulated, and there was mostly no federal oversight on what this meant. So if you got a um, $50 
paper piece from the Hagerstown, Maryland Bank, and you were in Pittsburgh, there's no telling how much that would consider be worth in trade. The problem was even larger during the Civil War, and we're going to bring this back to the Civil War. There was an unprecedented demand for hard currency. All of a sudden, we, the, neither the North nor the South had adequate bullion to be able to support the work that they needed to do. They needed to go buy ships, they needed to go buy guns, and they needed to pay soldiers. The Northern banks sort of sucked up a lot of the gold reserves. Um, the Northern banks funded the North with gold reserves until they just said, can't do this anymore. And the Confederacy couldn't do very much because they didn't have any credit with anybody. So enter the Legal Tender Act of 1862. And a gentleman named Elbridge Spaulding, Elbridge Spaulding, who was a New York congressman, was a strong advocate of the National the Legal Tender Act. And he realized that right now the, the United States was running spending two million dollars a day and they didn't have any coinage to back that up. There was no bullion to back that up. So it basically created, they authorized the printing of money that was going to be a national currency, it was going to be acceptable anywhere, but it was not redeemable in gold or silver. So effectively it's a fiat type of, of currency. It was not physically printed by the U.S. government, it was subcontracted by the wars and they, they suggest that um, nearly half a billion dollars in greenbacks had actually been printed. But now we're in the CSA had the same issue. They started printing in 1861. They're printing paper currency like nobody's business and printed about 1.7 billion dollars in paper currency. But how do you do this? How, well, how does the work get done? And that's back to you create this this opportunity, you create a new industry, you hire all the printers, and now what happens to all these pieces of paper? Well, each piece of paper had to be trimmed, it had to be signed. Um, the person who was named to be the treasurer of the United States in this new function was a gentleman named Francis Spinner, who I'll mention again. If you haven't heard a little bit about him, he was not a silver spoon kind of guy. He had come up in the ranks, he had been a saddle maker and apprentice and, and um, went through all the ranks and at the end he was, uh, before he became treasurer in the United States, he was the president of the Mohawk Valley Bank in New York. And back to the fact that there was bank printed money, his, his wife and daughters had been very useful to him in clipping Mohawk bank cards. So when he became treasurer of the United States and all these volumes of paper started coming in saying, you know, with people saying, okay, you got to keep cutting it, you got to keep signing it, he said, I'm hiring women. And guess what? He also said, they're not only more talented and they're not only more dexterous, but I can hire them for less. So um, we're back into that little spin just a little bit, but it doesn't last, that doesn't last long. This was an essential job. Many of the men who were clerks in the in other federal departments were off to war. So not only did women do a job that had never been done before in any kind of high volume, again, the federal government had never printed money, so it had no previous need for these high volume uses for cutters and signers. People didn't want to have, um, people initially wanted to have all the uh, bills that were printed be manually signed. But this got out of hand too. So, what wound up happening is that people, the women who were in the, um, the Treasury Girls, people who were working for the United States um, Treasury Department, were in many cases authorized to sign their own names on the line as for the Treasury or for the Registrar. This just happens to be um, a, a bill that shows Mr. Spinner on it and um, how he, many of the women who were recruited for these particular jobs, they were very well um, appreciated. Many were Civil War widows, they were wives of disabled Union soldiers, they were mothers of, of sons who had been killed in the war. And many got their jobs by actually being able to directly appeal to Abraham Lincoln, who did in many cases write a letter of reference for some of the people, some of the women. 
So hundreds of women are hired as treasury girls. They're showing up every day, and they're doing this new job, and again, for a slightly less wage than the previous men who were the clerks. Um, there, um, this was unusual at the time for women who were, I'll call them more sophisticated women, especially married women, to work outside the home. So, but these were not, these were all what I would call good jobs. However, of course, when women are in the workplace, there's always something that comes up like a scandal. And there were some scandals uh, where there was some impropriety uh, um, suggested, although uh, other than one circumstance, most of the improprieties were squelched. Um, later on and during this process, women got more adept at the work that they were doing and became leaders in detecting counterfeits. Now, I'm not exactly sure how that, that job actually worked, but nonetheless, um, there is a woman who was actually from Pennsylvania who was uh, had started out as a trimmer and later on was with the Redemption Division, which included all the functions of what's today the Mutilated Currency Division. So some of these issues started during the Civil War. And these are just some examples of what some of the paper money looked like, where if you look closely, and, and you can't really see that carefully here, but the small print does say for the treasurer, for the registrar. This was both in the north and the south. They just could not handle hand signing, um, having the authority to hand sign. This, in some bills, people who were asked to do the signing actually had distinction in themselves. and. Um, Rick, my partner, found this um, Julius Brutus Sturm, who actually was apparently a very famous artist. He had been signing for the Treasurer of the United States, and so his signature is quite valuable. If you happen to find a demand note like this with his signature on it, it's more valuable than just if Bob and Susie signed the note. Yes, sir? They are hand signed, but not by the Treasurer. Correct. Unlike today's bills. Well, today they're printed. Right. You know, right, exactly. Well, they didn't have that function. These were all printed elsewhere, printed in New York, and then the blanks came, the unsigned blanks on big sheets came down to Washington, D.C., where women are in a cutting room and they're cutting and trimming, and then others are actually doing the physical signatures. So very labor-intensive. It is now a new industry. This is way before what, this is like physical industrialization of a project of a job that had never been mass done before. Same thing in the South. We have seen lists of women who were all the cutters and the signers for the Confederacy as well. The Legal Tender Act, this is what got the whole thing going, is the right to be able to have the United States print its own money. And this was in 1862. Um, Congressman Elbridge Spaulding, whom we mentioned once before, was suggested to have done more to win the war than any general by being able to print so much money. But now following form with the book that we are pitching a little bit, which is minting, printing, and counterfeiting, yes, we had women who were joining ranks with the federal government in the coin production, and we had women who were now involved in the printed money, and yes, of course, during the Civil War, there were women who were involved in counterfeiting. And there's a particularly notorious woman out of Cincinnati who went by the moniker of Mother Roberts, and she apparently had this huge network of people who were working for her, running printed money around, and using that printed money to um, either resell on to other people who used it in their stores, and she could sell this cheaper money, and they could get more money for their um, in change for uh, products that they're selling. But one of the things that I liked about this particular quote, which was from a governmental type report, was that she was among the shrewdest and, I love the word, most unmanageable operators that they had dealt with. I thought that's kind of a, um, it's almost like a compliment, but um, she was apparently a very attractive woman, and the thought was that she was able to use her feminine wiles to move some of these monies along more rapidly. But there was one other thing that happened during the Civil War that 
is a little less related specifically to money being minted, printed, or counterfeited, and that's women in the home front taking on the subject of raising money, and raise money they really did. In 1861, President Lincoln accepted the fact that although we are going to war and we have all these new duties, there really wasn't enough money to pay everybody. There really wasn't and weren't enough people to be able to support the troops. So he put forward a, an, um, a proposal, I'll, I'll call it, to the loyal ladies, loyal women of America, and asked them to become involved in helping the troops. Now his first thoughts were, um, and he has a list, please send blankets, please send food, please send you know, a number of different physical goods. And women did this from their various home fronts. And that turned out to be kind of a nightmare because all of a sudden there's no logistics capacity at the end of the game for people to do the distributions. So what happened, the next step of this was learning from that lesson and women saying, I can raise money with the rest of them. And starting what were called sanitary fairs. And these sanitary fairs, you think of a fair today as kind of a carny thing, but these were enormous events that lasted a couple of weeks in many cases. Hundreds of thousands of people came and many into, I believe, the Philadelphia Fair. Pardon me, tens of thousands of people. Schools were closed. There were parades um, for the Baltimore Fair. Because Baltimore is so close to uh, Washington, D.C., President Lincoln was there. His wife was a part of the fair. And 54 county, or the, uh, most of the counties in Maryland participated by bringing stuff to Baltimore to sell. So this fair was a like a big yard sale of all premium stuff. And this is how they raised money. They raised money, they sent cash to the troops. They sent cash through the Sanitary Commission to get to where it needed to go most effectively. And I want to just point out again the fact that the Philadelphia Great Central Fair of 1864 raised over a million dollars in Civil War era money, which is approximately $25 million today. This was no small change. Um, the Great Central Fair itself um, had issued its own token, and you see that on the left. It's very, very collectible from June of 1864. And other memorabilia from the fair is also very collectible. There's a low, on the lower right is a badge. We were able to take a photo of this in 2019 when we were here. A gentleman named Richard Crosby, I'm not sure if he's here today. He's with Pan. But that's a picture of the restaurant associated with the Philadelphia Fair. Thousands attended, dignitaries. And I'm going to just take us come back to the U.S. Mint and recap a little bit. From the 1792 on through the 1900s, women who started out in these very um, um, personal kinds of texture, um, hand, uh, hand jobs, that didn't sound good. Um, <laughs> Manual labor. Manual labor, oh, right. thank you. <laughs> Um, wound up being continuing employment at the Mint and were able to then, by the time the late 1800s came, once industrialization came along, they were also um, invited to participate in operating machinery as well. And in 1911, the U.S. Mint was the first to have a woman uh, who, was, uh, who was named the assistant director. And one of the things that she said, she was a champion for equal pay, and her comment was, the only work I recognize as a supervisor is whether it's good work or bad work, and I really don't care who's doing it. So Francis Spinner, I'm going to take you back to him one more time, and he was the treasurer who hired all the treasury girls, and many of the treasury girls stayed on after the war ended. In the late 1800s, when Mr. Spinner passed away, there were still people in the tre in the Treasury, um, treasury who were... We have our next presentation coming up at 12.30 in the back hall. Phantom Mint of the West, the Dallas, Oregon. Applause. But anyhow, so Mr. <laughs> Mr. Spinner, um, the women who were that still with the Mint were so... Rick Lake. Again, that's going to be starting 
so thrilled with Mr. Spinner's leadership in bringing women into the Mint, um, pardon me, into the um, Treasury, that they actually paid to have an inscription go onto his monument. And his inscription says the fact that I was instrumental in introducing women to employment in the offices of the government gives me more real satisfaction than all the other deeds of my life. And I thank you to Pam for allowing us to be able to present. And on to Rick Lane. Perfect timing, oh, right? Man. Wow. So. <laughs> Hi. How you been? Good. I missed you. I missed you, man. Yeah. Thank you. That was so
to get to Portland and to other parts of the West Coast. And you can see that, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think, oh yeah, Fort Vancouver was nearby at the time. It was also called Fort Dallas at one time, but the bottom line there is it was established by the Army in the 1850s to keep watch over the Indians. And this is a hell of a story because the Indians here, unlike Dahlonega, Georgia, where they were driven away so people could have the gold, these guys, these tribes, of which there were many, had been there in that area, and that is literally a falls on the river at the Dalles. They've been <clears throat> trading, fishing, doing all kinds of very creative things for about 10,000 years before white folks showed up. Coins from the Hudson Bay Trading Company from the 1600s were found at all the grave sites of the, the, the dead Indians who were buried in a place called Memelusa Island. And uh, just to go on telling the story, I like this, the, 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 top, the coins at the top are from the Hudson Bay um, a Trading Company. The guy on the left was a very colorful guy <coughs> named one Eye Vic Trevitt. He was a saloon owner a po state politician, and a few other things. But he said, in the resurrection, I will take my chances with the Indians. And what he said literally was, I have but one desire after I die, to be laid to rest on Mamelus Island with the Indians. They are more honest and live up to the life that they have. In the resurrection, I will take my chances with the Indians. I thought that was pretty interesting. you like this also. There's literally uh, a website celebrating this town and its headline is welcome all pioneers <clears throat> warriors mountain men floozies and scalawags now that's an interesting town that'd be a hell of a place to put them in going back to the subject of all this gold there weren't really a lot of gold coins up in that area from san francisco it's a thousand miles away and the, the coins made it up to me federal payroll, but it wasn't the primary source of their cash. But when the Wells Fargo Express Company came along, in that same period of time, that made the transport of gold a lot safer. And so you started to see some things open up. The, the Transcontinental Railroad was about to go through. But during the Civil War itself, moving gold was still very perilous. And so they really wanted that mint in town so you wouldn't have to worry about conveying it. A thousand miles. Now, how many of you guys know about the uh, the SS Brother Jonathan, the ship that went down with a whole lot of gold on it? No dice? Okay. This, this story directly ties into the Dallas. The man that was chosen to run that mint was chosen by Abe Lincoln, and his name was William Logan. He was supposed to be known as a really nice guy. Now, the Brother Jonathan was a ship that went between San Francisco, up to Portland, up to Vancouver, and back again, routinely. And it carried federal payroll to the Army in different places and other opportunities for moving money around. It had a very low uh, balance, the low, uh, what do they call it? Draft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should read my own writings in there. And that's so you could carry a heavy, heavy load. And, it, and a great number of, of passengers. So, anyway, William Logan got on board that ship in San Francisco with his wife, and the brother Jonathan sunk in a sudden storm right off of the California coast where it meets Oregon. It's a really a freaky area where storms come up very suddenly. I read all about it. It's sort of like the Bermuda Triangle of the West. It went down with um, the loss of about 150 human lives, including William and his wife. And... In 1993 or 5, somewhere in there, they recovered all the gold coins that had come from the San Francisco Mint. They looked as good as the day they went down into the ocean in 1865. You can find them for sale, slabbed and graded. So that was an extremely important shipwreck of the time. A lot of life and a lot of money went down. Now, since there are no small children in the audience, I can at least tell my story about the All Night for Three Dollars token, which was very popular in the West. Um, <clears throat> you could get no service in the Dallas for 
less than one dollar. I don't care if you're buying a drink, you're buying some uh, lovely lady for the night, whatever it happened to be. Minimum charge, $25 or $1 today to get a all-night um, <clears throat> token to spend the night in a lady of uh, uh, a place of ill repute. It was $75 or $3 in hard cold cash at the time. Now, in the lower left-hand side, another famous, famous shipwreck that almost ruined our economy in 1857 was the SS Central America, which almost took down Wall Street at the time. And there were all these little pouches of, of gold dust, and those were called a pinch of gold. And I'm told that if you went to a bar in the Dallas, you could, the bartender, and they tried to get a guy with the biggest hands possible, would pick up a pinch of gold to serve you your whiskey. So you don't want to have somebody with small fingers. You want to have someone who takes a fistful of that stuff. And that was your acceptable pinch of gold in any of the 25 saloons in the Dallas. The pig and a poke I wanted to bring up is, yes, they also found gold purely in, in these little burlap bags. And they were already assayed and weighed. And that was called a poke. Now, the pig and the poke, I looked that up for you guys just to entertain everybody. From medieval times, when people would sell livestock or something else at a fair, and all you can see is a little bit of that, that item, the head. The, the, the warning was, you know, if you buy a pig and a poke, it means you don't know what you're buying, because you can't see the whole thing. So it was also sort of a warning to anybody, if you're given a bag that says it's a bag of gold, it may be, it may be a bag of fool's gold. So you just had to be very careful at the time. But in, in the days at the Dow's during the Civil War, what you spent money on mostly were tokens and gold pinches and a poke. I don't know somehow they all seem to relate to each other. Now, here's another part of the story that gets to me really interesting. I actually bought a book written by Ezra Meeker with his signature in it. And it turns out he was a very famous pioneer who had gone through the Dallas, just like you see there with his oxen and his wagon, just before the Civil War. He settled out in the valley near Mount Hood, became fairly prosperous, but toward the end of his life, and he lived to be like 98, he uh, actually flew back to Washington, met with Calvin Coolidge to promote the Oregon Trail and say, we've got to memorialize it, it's all being paved over, people are forgetting it. I walked it as a young man, we just don't want to lose any and all traces of it. He was so effective that monuments were placed all along the trail, including the Dallas. But the U.S. Mint created this beautiful coin that was between 1926 and 1939. They minted several hundred thousand of these coins. So you can see the wagon, the Conestoga wagon. The date on this one is 1933, and it celebrated the Indian heritage that he wanted to uh, honor because he lived successfully.